Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 6. This lady is situated here. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start looking at the ninth verse of Matthew chapter 6. And we find these words in Matthew 6 9. That this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Let us pray. Your gracious great heavenly Father, we just thank you. I just ask that you would take the illustration of my heart and my mind and make it yours, for they have come to hear from you, and the words they need to have are your words, not mine. According to pray. So today we're going to talk about this whole, give us this day our daily bread. Now, this is really confusing for a lot of people. Because if you're in America, you are probably one of the richest people in the world. And sometimes we don't feel like we're the richest people in the world, right? But if you have a car, and you have food in the freezer, and a refrigerator to last you more than a week, you are technically classified as top world population and riches. But see, so many times, what we have problems with is we have trouble with this simple part of the prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. See, there are too many of us out there and too many of us that don't understand the simplest things. See, we trust God to be our Savior. We trust that God is going to get us saved. We trust that God is going to deliver us from hell to heaven. But we don't trust Him with anything here on earth. We don't think that that has any correlation with what happens here on earth. And one of the biggest problems we have is we don't understand the love that God has for us. Flip over a page in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, starting in the seventh verse, it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. For anyone who asks receives, he who find, seeks finds, and he who knocks, the door will be open. Here, I love this verse. Which of you, if he has asked for a son, asked for bread, will give him a stone? Or to ask for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you, then, though you are evil, know how to do to give gifts to your children, how much more your Father in heaven will give good gifts to those who ask him? Exclamation point. Now, why is God saying that we're evil here? I don't know about you, but I know myself. I know the evil and the sin nature that I have, and I am not that good of a person. And even if I, not that good of a person, knows how to love my children, even as full as I love them, how much more will your Heavenly Father, who loves you, give you so much more? See, if you can trust your earthly family to give you bread when you're hungry, or fish when you need something, and not give you bad things, then how much more your heavenly Father, who loves you and who gave himself for you. Now, I think too many times we don't grasp the love of Christ. We don't grasp God's love for us. And because we don't grasp that, we can't comprehend it, and we can't figure it out, and we don't know what we're going to do. And we can't trust that God's got our daily going on lives. And he has us covered in our daily activities. See, too many times we forget about the garden of Gethsemane. Where Jesus <coughs> prayed to God because he knew what was coming. He knew the pain that he was getting ready to endure. And he knew the loss that he was getting ready to take. He knew all that was getting ready to happen 
to him. And he felt the loneliness. <laughs> and he asked God, will you please take this away from me? And God <clears throat> gave him strength. He told him no. Why? Because of God's love for us. Because of God's love for us, he told his son no. For his love for us, his son endured the cross. He was nailed to the cross. He was taken, his shoulders were dislocated. He was beaten to the point where he had so much blood loss, he couldn't even carry the cross beam up the hill. And he had to have somebody else do it for him. First time ever. <clears throat> and cause of love for you and for me, the trend was broken. And Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reason he forsaken Christ is love for me. His love for me. That's why the cross happened. Christ became our sins so that we would have to pay And yet, when trouble comes, when the days come, when life hits us, we forget what kind of love God has for us. When trials come, when the problems come, when Monday comes, over and over and over. At my desk, so I put up a little sign and uh, on a piece of paper that says, when the bad times should come and you wonder where God is, remember the cross. See, when God wants to demonstrate his love for you, when he wants you to remember how much he cared for you, when he wants you to remember how much he gave for you, he wants you to remember. And when you see that kind of love, then you kind of know without a shadow of a doubt, if he's got that kind of love for me, that he gives his son to die for me, then there ain't nothing that's going to be coming on this world in my daily life that he can't take care of and he hasn't provided for me. He loves you that much. I remember hearing a story once. There was a evangelism revival going on. Ours will be coming up soon, September. And uh, as the revivalist speaker came, there were a couple of teenage boys sitting in the front row, and they were kind of, you know, not paying attention as, as the speaker started talking. And then he noticed all of a sudden he started telling a story. He said, there is a story about a man who took a boy fishing. And this boy wasn't saved, but he was best friends with his son. And they went out, just, just out on the, in the ocean, just a little bit in the cove, and as they were fishing, a storm came up before they could get in. And their boat tipped. And the father had a choice to make. He could only save one of the children. He knew his son was saved. And he knew the other boy wasn't. As he swam over to the other boy, he grabbed the other son, the boy that wasn't saved. He looked at his son and said, son, I love you. And he brought the unsaved boy <coughs> back. He swam out to find his son gone. Now, the evangelist continued to preach, and he noticed he had the boys' attention, and the boys came back to the back, and they go, man, that was, that was a great sermon. <clears throat> and that was a great illustration. He goes, but there's no way that's true. The evangelist looked at him and said, I hate to tell you, but it absolutely was true. I was the boy that was saved. If a human being can find that kind of love, they have how much more a holy, righteous, loving God 
That's how much he cares for you. That's how much he loves you. That's how much when the trials come and problems come, he wants to wrap you up and he wants to carry you home and keep you safe. While you are here, God's love is for you. Number two, we don't understand the value. The 139th Psalm, starting the 13th verse, we find these words For you created me in my, you created my inner beings. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know them fully. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the death of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in the book before one of them came to pass. One of the stupidest paintings I think in the world is the Mona Lisa. Okay. Now, mind you, I'm not an art critic. But I think that dude done messed that one up. And I'm looking at this girl and I'm thinking, okay. And then my art teacher's like, no, Trey, you don't understand. Look, and she took a piece of paper and she went, she's smiling on this side. She's frowning on this side. I said, so the guy forgot what he was doing and painted it wrong. What's your point? Okay. Then my teacher informed me telling me how dumb my opinion was on this masterpiece and how it was invaluable. Okay. To me, I would pay a nickel for it. I think it's dumb. I think you done messed up the lips. Forget what you want to do, brother. And they paint it. My teacher informed me. My opinion didn't matter how much the value was. See, much like this, too many of us take our values from what the world says, or what people say, or what people have opinions of us about. Our value is found in what Christ says our value is. And Christ says our value is, you are so important, you are so loved, I died for you. You tell me how important you are. You tell me your value. Because Satan wants to tear you down, he wants to knock you down, he wants to say, oh, you're not that important, you're just another human being. No, you are a child of God who came and died for your sins because he loved you that much. That is your value. That's how much he cares. That's how much he loves you and values you. And you're just not another person. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, tells us this wonderful thing. It says, we are saved by grace through faith and not from works. Okay? First of all, you're saved by grace through faith. Okay? Once you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are saved. You don't earn it. You don't work for it. It is a free gift. Then it goes on to say that you are God's workmanship, God's masterpiece, created in the image of Jesus Christ to do good work which he has prepared in advance for you to do. Don't miss that. He has prepared good works in advance for you to do. Yes. You to do? Yes. But not for you to do mine. God has prepared in advance works for you to do. Not for salvation, but because you are the only one who can do what he needs you to do for his kingdom and for his glory. You are that special that he put you and valued you so much that he gave you a calling that only you can fulfill. You are so valuable that he put you in his plan for how to bring about his glory and his kingdom in this earth. You and nobody else can take your calling, your words, your actions.
action that God has called you to do. The God of the universe, the one who created all things, stops and goes, hey, I've got a project that all of you can do. Can you do it for me? Can you love me? Show me. Works for you. Matthew chapter 6. We start at the 25th verse. We find that we have the ability to be able to trust what God says He will do. So many of us are wrapped up in worry and anxiety and fear that we don't understand our value, we don't understand how much we're loved because anxiety and fear and worry drives it away. Look at what Matthew 6, 25 says. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you eat, or what you drink, or your body, about what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and life more important than clothes? Look at those. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? Who of you are worried to add a single hour to your life? Let's just pause there. How many of y'all farm? How many of y'all got gardens? How many of y'all farm? Any of y'all farm? Okay. How many of y'all have ever seen a bird out with a tila? Anybody? A tila. You got, you got a bird out there that's you know, just on a tractor, plowing up the ground? Anybody? Not me neither. You see a girl, bird out there planting seeds for you? You see a bird out there watering? You see a bird out there picking out the weeds? And yet, they eat. Because God takes care of them. Now, think about this. How much more important are you than this bird? You have an eternal soul. You who God has created, you who Christ sacrificed himself for, how much more important are you than that bird? But yet we worry. And why do you worry about clothes? See how lowly the fields grow? They do not labor or spoil. And yet I tell you, even Solomon, all his splendor, was not dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow and thrown into fire, Will it not also clothe you more? Oh, ye of little faith. So what do you say? What shall I eat? Or what shall I drink? Or what shall I wear? The pagans run after these things. But listen to this. But your heavenly Father knows your needs. Your dad knows what you need. Your heavenly Father, who loves you more than his own son, knows what you need. Here's an answer to all your worries, all your fears. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Each day has enough troubles. You just need to find what God wants you to do. Walk with him, and he will take care of all the things you need. He loves you. You are so immensely valuable to him, it's not even funny. Give yourself to him. Trust in him. Love him. And know that he loves you enough to take care of every problem you have coming your way. But listen, that starts with you accepting the free gift. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then He's waiting for you. He wants you to come forward so that you can be His child and so that He can pour all His love and all He has for you on you. If you need to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior today, come forward today. Don't delay. If you're looking for a church home and God has called us to be a person, come forward. Listen, if you need someone to pray for you, because you got some bad stuff going on in your life, you got some stuff that's wearing you down. Listen, we're not going to judge you. We're going to love you just like God does. Where you are, pray for you, and guide you, and help you to where He become, where He, where you become, where He wants you to be. Come forward, man.
Let's stand.